Okay. Good Friday morning, everyone. I am delighted to be with you this morning for the Urban Ecology Center's Backyard Naturalist. For fun, I went through the archives and realized that this is episode number 193. We, in some form or another, have spent 193 hours together collectively in this community since April of 2020, which means that if my math is correct, and it sometimes is, episode number 200 is going to happen on January 5th of 2024, which is the first episode of the new year. So we will have to do something to celebrate episode number 200. But this is episode number 193. And this episode represents my second favorite culinary spice ingredient, my second favorite culinary ingredient. We had a long talk before this about what makes a spice an herb, uh, uh, whatever. But this is after maple, I think vanilla is my second favorite culinary ingredient. Uh, it's just so damn good um, and important. And I dare you to make chocolate chip cookies and leave out the vanilla. Just try it. Uh, it, it I mean, or don't because it's going to not taste good. Well, it'll taste like something, but it won't taste like a, a cookie because vanilla is a flavor enhancer. And that makes everything around it taste wonderful. Just like some of you bring out the best in all of us uh, from a social perspective, vanilla brings out the best in a lot of other ingredients. Um, it's a flavor enhancer. Uh, and it's also a, a very important, um, arguably one of the most important, but there's several that are more important, uh, probably uh, culinary ingredient around the world. Um, We'll get a, a little bit into the human aspects of this, um, but really for me, the exciting part is in the natural history, the the, the botanical parts of, of vanilla. It's a fascinating plant, orchid, bean, flower. Um, so I hope you can can sit back and com sit back and comfortably relax uh, from wherever you find yourself as we present episode 193 also known as episode 12 of season five, Vanillas in the Mist. I'd like to thank you all for being with here with uh, us today. Um, honored that you chose to spend your time in this learning journey with us this morning. And I'd like to send a huge thank you to the subscribers of this program. You are the lifeblood of this community. You keep it going. And as long as you wanna be here and we can, we will be here. Uh, purchasing a subscription is certainly one of the best ways to support this program and also the research team at the Urban Ecology Center. Uh, membership brings you hassle-free registration every week. We do it for you, and it brings you uh, free to the subscriber monthly field trips to explore beautiful green spaces in the Milwaukee area and an uh, annual subscriber appreciation party, which is tomorrow. If you still want to come, let us know right away. We'll be exploring the Blue Heron Wildlife preserve together up near Sockville, Wisconsin, uh, which includes a Midwestern special, the potluck lunch. Um, I imagine there's going to be some vanilla joining us for that potluck as well. And then I just want to give a, a, a little heads up that um, the next monthly field trip is going to be exploring a local area that many of you are already very familiar with. It's one of the most iconic and well-known green spaces of Milwaukee Lake Park, which makes it a little bit of a challenge to give a a tour through that because there's a lot of people that know a lot about a lot more about that park than I do. Um, but I think what we're going to try to do is look at it through the lens of a backyard naturalist uh, and weave in a little bit both of the human and the natural history of the area. So registration for that trip is already up on our website. It's open to everyone and free for subscribers. I'm really excited again that next week's backyard naturalist is going to be taking place on a Monday of a first. This is usually a Friday program. Uh, November 20th at 7 p.m. We are hosting, along with Boswell Books, uh, author Margaret Rankel, who's wrote, written several wonderful books. She's a, a frequent contributor to the New York Times uh, editorial section, and she is going to be talking about her latest book, which is just uh, perfectly entwined into our community, The Comfort of Crows, A Backyard Year. Um, and uh, that, that conversation is going to be hosted by UEC staff member Eliza Woods as well. So that should be a really fun evening um, tomorrow evening or Monday evening, excuse me. Um, and uh, you can get these books at Boswell 
uh, or you can order them through Boswell. Um, and it's a wonderful read. I'm almost done with it. It's it's a it's a collection of essays. So it's not a book you need to like read in one sitting. It's a book you can kind of pick up and and just kind of absorb and put down, uh, which is wonderful. And uh, we, uh, the Urban Ecology Center, I'll just quickly run through our, our, our trio, our hat trick of eco-travel destinations slated for 2024. First up, we have this wonderful trip planned to Southern California in late February. Late February is when things start to get a little gloomy here in the Midwest and it gets a little tiresome the winter and the gloom. And if you're ready for spring, we're gonna be going somewhere nice and warm. Uh, we are still dotting some T's and crossing some I's on the details, but you can now reserve a spot with a fully, fully refundable deposit right now as we speak. So if you wanna know more, contact Amanda and um, we'll also have an information session coming up soon. There are now four available spots left on our once in a lifetime trip to the Galapagos next April. Uh, truly a magical experience in many, many ways. And um, we're also still working on our wheelchair accessible trip to Costa Rica in August. So if you are interested in any of these trips, please contact myself or anyone on the research team at the Urban Ecology Center. And then quickly before we move our attention towards vanilla, we are currently in a really fantastic period if you like to look for meteor showers. Um, and I'll explain why. So we're, we're kind of in a confluence now of about four major meteor showers. So some are kind of on their way out, some are just beginning, some are about to be at their peak. Um, so starting with the Orionids, we are at the tail end, pun intended, of passing through debris left by the tail of Halley's Comet. And uh, so these are meteors that are emanating from the constellation Orion. That's why they're called the Orionids, but you can see them just about anywhere in the sky. They are on their way out, but we are about to approach peak viewing for the Leonid meteor showers, which is produced by debris from Comet Temple Tuttle. And most meteor showers are best viewed after midnight because the planet is kind of going into the space rather than you know the based on the direction of your of your traveling if you think of your the planet as like your car windshield well if if you if your windshield is spinning which would probably mean you're spinning out and that's not a good way to think about it but you want you want to be kind of going into the the meteor shower from a, a viewing perspective uh rather than trying to see them out your rear view mirror so that's why after midnight we kind of enter that period where we're not only moving forward but we're kind of facing the front of, of the journey um, around the sun. So oftentimes meteor showers are best after midnight, but um, that's, you know, you can, you can, you can pretty much see a meteor just about any time uh, of night, um, but uh, best viewed after midnight. Uh, for this one, we'll have a, a quarter moon. So uh, not a terrible light situation, but not the best. Um, but uh, if you wanna be more intentional, you can always drive somewhere with the dark skies. Um, and and uh, assuming you don't have the darkest of skies at your house, but you know if you get up in the middle of the night and need to use the bathroom and you do have fairly decent dark skies, you can can try to look out for some meteors. So those are two that are currently going on. We're also approaching an interesting period, December second and third. We're experiencing the peak of a formerly reliable meteor shower called the Andromedids. So. They actually reached their peak activity back, we think, in the late 1800s. And since that time, the activity has slowed quite a bit. Uh, so it's the, the debris is scattered. Um, but every once in a while, we get a surprise and the Earth pass, passes through another patch of debris from Comet Biela. So we had some nice surprises in 2011 and 2021. And every year it's like, you know, well, we might we might not get get from this kind of defunct meteor shower. Uh, not not completely defunct. And then finally, we are entering into the early phase of the Geminid meteor shower. So this is different from the others because these are these meteors originate from an asteroid, while the others originate from a comet. Um, the asteroid is Phaethon, um, and some astronauts believe that Phaethon is actually a dead comet or a comet that lost its icy shell. So the nights of December thirteenth and fourteenth. We're predicting potentially a really good storm of 120 meteors per hour, uh, partly because we're going to have a very young waxing crescent moon that sets early to provide us with dark skies. 
Um, so we're at the tail end of the Orionids. We're at peak Leonids. We may or may not see the Andromedids, and we're at the very beginning of the Geminids. So just a good time in general to look for shooting stars. Um, okay, and speaking of stars, my personal star of this show, the vanilla. Um, vanilla is a word. It's an adjective. It's a noun. It's a plant. It's a flower. It's an orchid. It's a bean. If I want to describe something as very ordinary, I could say that something is very vanilla. And that is used in a lot of different contexts, um, clothing, food. Uh, it usually means that it's it has the context of being plain, ordinary, a little boring, everyday, banal. Um, there are some in this world, um, I, and it sounds like maybe some even listening right now that think that ordering vanilla ice cream is about the worst thing you can do. Um, there are others, myself included, that absolutely loves vanilla ice cream. Um, that, you know, it, a, a good vanilla ice cream is a treat worth savoring, in my opinion. Uh, I absolutely love the flavor. There are others that opinion that's just a waste. You just wasted your money by ordering vanilla and not chocolate or something else. Uh, my second favorite plant after maple, as I mentioned, um, I do have some some statistics here to, to tell Eric Nelson in particular, according to the International Ice Cream Association, vanilla is the favorite flavor of 29% of the population. Chocolate is the favorite of 8.9% of the population. So chew on that for a little bit. Is it an herb or a spice or a, I don't know. Either way, I think vanilla is delicious. Um, and Okay, so I was pondering recently uh, something that had to do with this is this is, again, one of my own personal journeys that you may or may not relate to. But at some point, you know, I love vanilla ice cream. And then I was thinking about for some reason, I was thinking ice cream and yogurt. And and so if you, if you look at yogurt, yogurt comes in plain and vanilla. But I didn't really realize that until later in my life. Like for a long time, I really honestly thought these were synonymous, that if 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 mom or dad got plain ice cream, it was pretty much the same as vanilla ice cream. I didn't I hadn't made that journey of understanding that these are separate things yet. Um, I just thought they were really both kind of plain. Um, I really like the, the fruit on the bottom corn syrupy stuff that just made everything super, super sweet. Um, but then when I you know, my tastes matured a little bit and I started doing my own shopping, I realized that oh, there is a difference between plain yogurt, which is very plain, and I love now, um, and vanilla yogurt, which tastes really good on its own. Um, and I think they both taste good on my own, but now I'm, I'm finally understanding the difference. Um, so then when I when I realized that this is the, the case for yogurt, I took this basic concept to a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Chris Steinkamp, who worked at Purple Door Ice Cream, and I said, so when you're making ice cream, do you also make like a plain ice cream and a vanilla ice cream, just like it was with yogurt? And he said, nope, there is no such thing as plain ice cream in this context, in the context of his company. There is, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, but Purple Door doesn't make plain ice cream. Most, most companies don't make plain ice cream like you have plain yogurt because all ice creams are made with a base of vanilla. So... I had assumed chocolate ice cream was just flavored with chocolate, but I was wrong. It starts with the base of vanilla and then chocolate is added. So same with mint, same with pistachio, same with Rocky Road. They all start with that vanilla base. Um, all major ice cream brands have vanilla, not only because, in my opinion, it has that standalone delicious flavor, but it's because it has it's a flavor enhancer. And it's, it's one of the reasons that all those other flavors of ice cream are just so eye-poppingly good. Um, you know, this is similar to like maybe a little bit like salt. So salt, salt is a savory flavor enhancer. Salt tastes good on its own, um, but it also brings out the savory uh, flavors of things like soups and stews. Um, so you have your salt as a savory flavor enhancer. Your vanilla is a sweet flavor enhancer. Um, so all ice cream flavors would taste much less rich, probably much less flavorful without that vanilla base. So think about that next time you make fun of 
somebody for ordering vanilla ice cream because we're all eating vanilla ice cream, just different flavors of vanilla. Um, and it's not just ice cream, it's cookies, it's it's cakes, it's pies, it's everything else. It, the, the vanilla really uh, is, is an important staple. And um, it's not quite that simple. There is actually something called plain ice cream and depend on you know parts of the world, particularly I think in Europe, um, that you will get something called classic ice cream. You can make this at home. Um, and it is just, it's a different, it's not vanilla uh, ice cream. There is no vanilla in it, um, but it is it is an ice cream that is loved by some. It's just not the mainstream ice cream. So you can get plain ice cream and you know, plain milk, plain yogurt doesn't have sugar, but plain ice cream is gonna still have plenty of sugar. So it's gonna taste good. It just doesn't have that vanilla. Um, so didn't realize I'd get on the soapbox this quickly. Um, I will continue to champion the awesomeness of vanilla, uh, but we're here to learn about it as a plant, a plant that grows in our backyards um, and other, well, probably not in our backyards, but in the world's backyards, the green spaces of the world. So vanilla is a plant. It's a flowering plant. It's a monocot, uh, meaning the seeds typically contain one cotyledon or embryonic leaf for growth, which distinguishes them from the dicots, which have two um monocots we usually think of as grasses uh so grasses like sea grasses regular grasses wheat corn um palm trees uh so this is kind of where you start with when you're going down the family tree of vanilla you start with uh this this wonderful group um vanilla is in the order asparagalis and it's not a surprise to know that the kind of type specimen of this group is actually asparagus. Uh, vanilla is is uh, in the asparagus group um, that makes its way onto our dinner plates and causes our pee to smell so funny. Uh, from an economic and cultural perspective and from a culinary perspective, this is some consider the second most important group of monocots after the order poales, which has a lot of your grasses and your cereals, your wheats. Um, the But the, the family reunion of Asparagalis is going to be pretty cool. It's going to include some really cool cousins um, like onions and garlic and leeks, saffron, the most expensive spice in the world. Uh, and you have things like aloe and irises, lilies, um, Lily the Valley. So really cool group of an important group of plants. Uh, and then we kind of go from here, we go down another really cool and elite branch of the tree of life. We move to the orchid. So the vanilla is an orchid. Um, this is a really diverse and widespread group of plants that often have very colorful and fragrant flowers and are often prized by people. There are almost 30,000 species of orchids or about 10% of all plants with seeds. Um, I'm not gonna say a lot about orchids that that could that could and should and will be its own uh, episode someday, but um, the one of the shared characteristics of orchids is that they have a, a very modified flower floral system. Uh, it has a, a petal called the labellum that's gonna be important later. It, the, the stamens and carpels are in, in or infused together, extremely small seeds, um, and uh, important as perfumes, important in the horticultural world, their house plants, garden plants, um, and in some cases as, as spices. Uh, and so humans have long and complex relationships with the orchids. Uh, many of them are air plants or epiphytes. Um, some of them are still connected to the ground with roots, and they include some of the most stunning flowers in the plant world, in a lot of our opinions. Then you move to the genus of orchids that is called the genus vanilla. That one's an easy one to remember. Uh, we have over 100 species of vanilla around the world. Vanilla is a Spanish diminutive for vaina, which means pod. So, um, as romantic as this plant is, in my opinion, the name simply means vainilla, a little pod. Um, most, most vanilla species have fragrant flowers, um, and they have a very peculiar adaptation that 
each flower opens up in the morning and then closes. So the flower is open for a day. Uh, if, if, uh, and if this is, this is more typical for, this isn't the case for all vanillas, but for some of the vanillas that are most important to us as flavors, um, the flower is open for one day and then it, it, it closes. So, um, they're most entirely found in the tropics, sometimes the subtropics. There are a few native vanilla species found in the continental US, but only in the southern tip of Florida. Uh, and so technically, when we talk about vanilla, we're talking about this whole group of orchids, over 100 species. But again, only about 20 are used in flavors. And really, for all intents and purposes, when we're talking about vanillas in our, our kitchen, uh, we are referring to one major species, vanilla planifolia also known as the flat-leaved vanilla. Um, there are two species that are called West Indian vanilla. They're both used uh, as flavors, but um, this is the one that is mainly used. This is kind of the dominant vanilla species um, that, that's used around the world. Uh, it is an endangered species. Um, and the, the, the reason that it's the source of vanilla has to do with its own special blend of chemicals of, of spices, but the the primary spice that um, gives vanilla its strong flavor is called vanillin, uh, and the vanilla plant can grow either as a rooted plant or as an epiphyte, a, an air plant without contact with the soil. The flowers aren't super flashy; they're they're greenish, yellowish, decently large for for a vanilla and um, they actually don't have much of a strong scent. Some vanilla flowers do have a very strong scent. Um, so in this particular species, the flower does truly only open for one day. Opens in the morning. If it's pollinated, then it's gonna stay and turn into a fruit. If it's not, the plant just sheds that flower, it's gone. Um, that that seems like a very short window, but the the flowering, time will you know can take one to two months so on a, a plant you can have flowers opening for a period of six seven weeks um, even though each individual flower is only going to open for one day um the plants are self-fertile meaning pollination really only requires a simple transfer from the anther to the stigma but the problem is it doesn't do this on its own it needs help that's a, that's not you know that's not unique to the vanilla plant. That's a lot of self pollinators need that help. Um, but these are all going to come into play a little bit later when we talk about the production of vanilla. After the flower is pollinated, um, the flowers turn into the fruit. The fruit pods that we call the vanilla bean, um, which is better described as a a long fleshy pod. I don't know, kind of like a small banana or a maybe a green bean. It remains on the plant for quite a lot while after the pollination, about nine months. So the vanilla pod gestation period is about the same as a human gestation period. And as the pod ripens, it starts to get darker, eventually turns black. Um, and a, a mature vanilla pod, the kind that you would buy in the store that is, you know, cured and dried, it, as it ages, it gives off a strong and, and pleasant aroma. Um, so usually the pods are harvested while they're still green. Uh, like this pile of green bean looking vanilla pods and then they're cured and dried off the plant. And then they turn that rich black color, which now kind of looks like charred asparagus, but this is what you would buy in the grocery store if you're gonna buy a vanilla pod. So each pod contains thousands and thousands of just tiny, tiny, tiny seeds. So again, if you buy a vanilla pod from the store for a recipe, you spend all that money, you know, probably $10 for maybe a few uh, you, you basically cut open the pod, you scrape out thousands of these tiny, tiny specks of seeds, um, which are now kind of resembling caviar. And this is this is the, the culinary gold. This is what we pay the big money for. Uh, it's only about 2% of the mass of that plant. So if you think about buying vanilla pods per pound and spending a lot of money, you're spending a lot of money just for a really small portion of that plant. Um, it's the second most expensive spice per pound after saffron. Um, and there's so many reasons why it's it's super expensive, and and we'll we'll kind of talk about that as we go. Um, the plant itself is native 
to Central and South America, from kind of Southern Mexico down through Colombia and Brazil. Um, it is now cultivated throughout the tropics, throughout the Caribbean islands, other parts of South America. Um, it's cultivated in South Florida. It's it's jumped across the oceans into Central Africa, Southern Asia. Um, it is a very picky plant. It it to to grow this well. This is not a plant you would want me to grow because I'm not good with plants. To grow this plant well, it it needs a pretty thin set of conditions. Um, so it it needs for the average temperature year round to be between 70 and 80 degrees. That rules out a lot of the world, Fahrenheit. Um, uh, apologies to all of the world that doesn't use Fahrenheit. Um, it requires high humidity. Uh, if temperatures get down too low into the 50s or too high into the 90s, the plant will probably wither and die. They require two meters of rain per year at a minimum. Um, they need well draining soil if they're rooted to the ground, rich in calcium and potassium. It needs the, the soil pH needs to be between six and seven. And they grow best from about 500 feet to 3000 feet. And they require a dry period to trigger the flowers. So it's like just all of those characteristics alone really, really narrows down the place where you could grow vanilla naturally. It's a very, very specific set of of uh, temperatures. It's kind of like my father who likes to be outside when it's between 72 and 73.6 degrees and sunny. Um, but it's even worse. There's a lot more characteristics uh, that that this plant needs to grow in. So already makes it hard to, you know, grow. Um, the Because of the way humans have changed the world, uh, the natural habitats for vanilla have shrunk considerably. The natural places where it can grow. Uh, humans can provide some of this stuff in greenhouses or other ways to control things, but their natural habitat is is really shrinking and it is is listed in 2017 as an endangered plant. Um, so this is this is one of the one of the layers uh, that explains why vanilla is so expensive. It's just very hard to grow. It's hard to find the right conditions. Um, but then, you add on to that, the biggest problem is that uh, is pollination. So even with all of the attention that we humans pay to this plant, we still don't have a really good idea of how it's naturally pollinated. We know there are some bees, there's potentially a hummingbird that will, will do the natural pollination, but there's a lot we don't know, like really what drives it. And the thing is the vanilla plant was never really widespread. It was kind of a, just a, a smaller patchy plant and um, and so when we decided we really wanted this plant, we just didn't know much about it. And it's really, really hard to grow. Um, so a lot of attention paid to it, but we still don't know a lot about the natural uh, pollination process. Um, I'll talk to, about this a little bit later, but at some point in our history, we realized that if we're going to grow vanilla plants, with the very few contenders for pollinators that aren't widespread, uh, you just can't take them overseas and plant them. Um, so the industry itself is entirely hand pollinated, entirely. When you buy vanilla, it is hand pollinated, um, which is an arduous job that takes a lot of effort and a lot of know-how. Um, and uh, it's another contributor to the very high cost high cost economically and high cost socially uh, because the the industry uses a lot of child labor. Um, and again, we'll get into the, the human sides of that a little bit later. Uh, vanilla seeds. So once you have the, the, the pod and the seeds, next thing plants need is dispersal. And there's a, a number of, we know a little bit more about how um, vanilla seeds are dispersed. There's actually quite a lot of animals that will disperse them, but the main players are bees. Um, and uh, we also know that possums and spiny rats are are major contributors to uh, dispersal and they will eat them, eat the seeds and poop them out, which means I am ready to start a new ice cream company. So you've probably heard of civet coffee. It's this like super expensive 
boutique coffee brand. I think it's the most expensive coffee in the world. And it, the reason it's so expensive is that the coffee beans are eaten by civets, pooped out, um, and then the process of going through the digestive tract of the civets, civets processes the coffee beans, and that's what we roast. Um, really probably kind of gimmicky. Uh, also not great uh, in terms of the way that the civets are raised to do this. Uh, but I think this is a good idea. So I'm ready to jump on this bandwagon. And if any of you want to come with me, I want to make an ice cream brand that is made with vanilla beans that have been through the digestive tract of spiny rats. So I just need a marketing partner. I need a name, some something like rat cream or something. Uh, if you're interested, contact me afterwards. I can like I, I can smell the profits. It smells like vanilla. It smells really good. Um, but speaking of smelling things that have been through animals, both beavers and cows are animals that eat and secrete things. And these two animals have and might play a role in the artificial vanilla flavor world. So to really understand how beavers and cows fit in, um, let's kind of go through this, this, this human history with vanilla a little bit. Um, so historically, uh, what we know of anyway, is that vanilla was a very important and prized spice to the the advanced human civilizations in the Americas where it is native. Um, and there's the evidence we have supports that the Totonics and the East coast of Mexico were the first to have cultivated vanilla um, and used it extensively in their food. The Totonics were conquered by the Aztecs in the 1400s and then vanilla became an important part of the Aztec culture. Uh, which is um, an, an essential ingredient, in fact, in chocolate, the, the drink that many of you love, uh, the drink of the gods. So with vanilla, also cacao, chili, and corn. And then, of course, the, the dark modern history leads us to the Spanish who conquered the region and started exporting some of the new things they found to Europe. Uh, not just food, they would export things like jaguars and opossums and armadillos, things that were new to, to Europe. Um it, uh, to continue on the dark side, they would export entire teams of ball players to play for uh, people in Europe. Um, and first, vanilla was thought of as really no more than that essential additive for chocolate. That was how it was presented in the West, in the Western world. And um, that was its, its primary focus until an apothecary who was under the employ of Queen Elizabeth began separating the vanilla and using it to flavor meats. Uh, so then Queen Elizabeth apparently just loved what the meat tasted like with that vanilla enhancement. And she started, uh, the story goes, asking for pretty much all of her food to incorporate vanilla flavor, it just really had a taste for it, um, which led to vanilla being a, a culinary ingredient in the Western world for the elite and spreading among the elite. Um, and then later, the French started using vanilla to flavor ice cream. Uh, and then a visiting states person from the U.S. named Thomas Jefferson apparently was so enamored with uh, vanilla ice cream that he copied down a recipe now preserved in the Library of Congress. If you go back to the good old U.S. of A, uh, after, after domination, ice cream and vanilla started to be in high demand uh, as both, uh, both an ingredient to be added to ice cream and also an essential ingredient in a new soft drink company created by John Pemberton, whose Coca-Cola was advertised as an esteemed brain tonic and intellectual beverage. So now the demand for vanilla is just is skyrocketing, but the world has not yet figured out how to keep up with this demand because the vanilla plant is so finicky when it comes to reproduction. It's just very difficult to produce on a large scale, even in its native habitat. Um, and people had been trying and failing to grow vanilla in other parts of the world until 1841. This is when a person who was enslaved on the island of Réunion in the Réunion in the Indian Ocean, uh, a 12-year-old named Edmund Albius, who was really into botany and figured out that the vanilla blooms can be hand-pollinated using a small stick about the dimensions of a toothpick and then a flip of a thumb to allow the anther and stigma to unite and self-pollinate. So basically performing the, the same 
mechanical functions as the bees did in the native land. So now uh, you have uh, just as with this knowledge, um, you just have the capability, which leads the way to a sudden drastic increase in vanilla output. Um, and for a while, long time, it was all coming from Réunion uh, because of Edmund Albius. And, um, you know, of course, uh, treated terribly his entire life with all the systemic racism and everything, but it was a really important uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? A really important um, discovery. So as soon as you have, so you have you have Reunion uh, just kind of supplying for a while the global demand for vanilla, a really, really big um, concentration now on that island. And that soon spilled over into the island where most of us probably um, think of when we think of vanilla, which is Madagascar. So in Madagascar is a bigger island. Uh, conditions were ripe for more plantations taking advantage of human labor, and it really took off. So today, about 80% of the world's natural vanilla comes from farms in Madagascar. And a good chunk of the rest of the natural vanilla in the world still comes from Réunion. Um, but even with, even though they were able to really increase the supply of vanilla to the world, they were still weren't able to meet the demand globally of vanilla. It was just that the, the supply was definitely not able to keep up with the demand. So this led to a really strong effort by botanists and chemica chemists to reproduce this flavor artificially because not only because we wanted to, but that then would be very profitable for whoever was able to figure this out. So the first step was to isolate the main flavor of the vanilla bean, which is vanillin. It's not the only thing. Um, vanillin is just one of the flavoring components of the natural vanilla, but it's the strongest one. And it's the one that most of us would associate. If you were just to eat pure vanilla and you would say, oh, that's vanilla because um, it's the strongest flavor. So early successes in producing vanillin as an artificial flavor involved things like pine bark, uh, clove oil, and rice bran. But then probably one of the biggest breakthroughs came from a very common polymer called lignin. So lignin is one of the main components of the plant cell and its structure allows for a fairly straightforward isolation of the vanillin flavor. So it's pretty straightforward to go from lignin to vanillin and there's a lot of lignin in the world because it's essentially the, the cell walls of plants. Um, so, you know, if your eyes glaze over about the, the chemistry part of this, um, if you consider this, going back to that unlikely pair that began the story, beavers and cows eat lots and lots of plants and therefore they're eating lots and lots of cell walls. Uh, the cell walls have lignin and then the bodies of these animals process that lignin and it turns out that when beavers process lignin, they produce something called castor oil or castorium from castor sacs, uh, which are near their anus. And for whatever reason, uh, for whatever adaptive reasons, humans kind of go nuts for the taste and smell of castorium. Uh, that's that's from these castor sacs near the, the anal sacs of the beaver. Um, it smells and tastes delicious to us. Um, it has a strong taste of vanilla, which makes sense because the beaver is processing lignin into um, the vanillin-like structure. And so castorium was used as a vanilla substitute for ice creams and for other sweet treats um, from like flavored oatmeals. Uh, today, you can still buy a Swedish uh, treat called Bever Snaps. It's a, a, a liqueur that uses castorium. Um, so if you want to know more, it's it's an, it's a fascinating story. And we, we go into this more in an episode from season three called Beaver Pitch. Um, and uh, hopefully we can convince Amanda to to do a sequel on Beaver because she probably knows a lot more uh, than than. Oh, wait, she did. <laughs> That's right. You can watch you can watch the second Beaver uh, episode, which I still haven't watched. Um, OK. So, uh, so then, so we, we got beaver secretions being a substitute for natural vanilla. Uh, and realistically, you, you're running into the same problem problems that you're running in with natural vanilla. So 
how are you gonna gonna mass produce an anal secretion from America's largest rodent? Uh, I've included the cow here because the demand for vanilla is still very high today and new research suggests that there may be a way, modern research, uh, to isolate the vanillin from the lignin in cow cakes. So cow poo may play a, a role in future vanilla flavorings. Um, so be fun to chew on that cut in your mind for a little bit. Beavers played a, a past role in vanilla flavoring. Cows may play a future role. But the, the biggest breakthrough in the artificial vanilla flavoring world came uh, back in the 1970s when a company called Rhone Poulenc, which is now Solve, commercialized a way to synthesize vanillin from a petrochemical precursor called guiacol. About 85% of the artificial vanilla we enjoy today comes from this method, which comes from natural gas and oil. So uh, the rest of the artificial vanillin comes from lignin, which is plant-based. But most of the artificial vanilla is petrol based that uh, uh, we use today. Something a little scary to think about. And so where are we today? Vanilla is still an essential ingredient in cuisine around the world. Uh, almost as important as salt and pepper, I would imagine. Um, I, I think if you were to ask somebody to, to stock a pantry with spices, this would probably be top five, top 10 for most people. Um, Almost all of vanilla, more than 99% of what we consume is made artificially. And the global production at the same time of natural vanilla is falling. Uh, at the same time, there's this consumer demand for more natural products. So major companies like Nestle are in a push to eliminate artificial flavors. That's going to be really hard. Um, increasing demand and decreasing supply is happening in vanilla. So in 2016, seeds from cured vanilla beans, the seeds, the, the tiny seeds cost about $25,000 per pound, which was up about tenfold from previous years. Still not as expensive as, um, as uh, the other thing. So if you buy a pound of uh, saffron, if you buy a pound of vanilla beans for maybe, let's say, I, I was looking on Amazon, you can, the, the pods, you can buy the bean pods you know, $100, $150 per pound, maybe even $200. And again, only 2% of that is what you're actually using. Um, all of this led to a huge increase and is continuing to lead to a huge increase in research and marketing. So from the marketing side, you have companies like Breyers uh, and Trader Joe's that are adding flecks of natural vanilla to their products. But they're, they're not telling you those flecks are coming from spent vanilla pods that the 90, the you know, the 90 some percent of the ped that we don't use uh, just to, to give it that natural look. There's absolutely nothing that adds to flavor. It's just purely cosmetic to make you think you are buying something that is a little more, you know, hoity-toity. Uh, so advertising has a lot to do with it. Um, Nilla wafers can claim their vanilla flavor comes from a mix of natural and artificial flavors and leave it at that. Uh, so we have no idea. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, I don't know, I, I, may, maybe with vanilla wafers, it's a little bit better. We're not actually thinking we're eating vanilla um, in there because, you know, if you're eating vanilla wafers like I do, you're not really caring much about that hoity-toity panache or whatever. So I'm not here to judge anybody uh, who's eating a delicious handful of vanilla wafers. Um, some of you may remember, if you're my age or older, a uh, product that rolled out in the 80s, I think to great controversy, it, it was a lot of controversy, and the product was called New Coke. Coke had been around for, you know, a century more, uh, and now they were changing the formula, and it led to just outrage like you wouldn't believe. And the way the story was told to me was this was Coke's way of, well, depending on who you talk to, getting rid of the really expensive vanilla that they had been adding to their formula, trying to get around that because it was so expensive. Um, others think it was a marketing gimmick just so that when they went back to classic cloak, we would all be like really excited about it and go back. But the, the way it was told to me is that it was, it was just really hard for Coke continue to put vanilla in, um, in their products and, uh, particularly due to the, the global demand and supply. And so, uh, they went to this new Coke, which didn't have vanilla. And then they were able to kind of double back on it is when they reintroduced the classic Coke. 
they were now able to to bring in those artificial vanilla flavors uh, much more easily. And they were also able to introduce vanilla Coke. Uh, so kind of a, a double win for them, uh, which also didn't have actual like, natural vanilla in it. Um, but vanilla being so popular and, and so so studied and all the taste scientists they had, um, even after that initial backlash, Coke did really, really well. Um, so on the research side, side, I think again, if you're you know looking at the wonders of of capitalism, I think most companies are grappling uh, with what are the loopholes where I can still kind of get on this natural kick and say my vanilla such and such has all natural ingredients. So that's leading to a lot of research in genetically modified yeasts that can generate pure vanilla when they ferment ingredients like lignin and still meet all those FDA requirements to be able to label themselves as natural ingredients. So there's, it's, it's really controversial. It's a huge conundrum for all us. All. There. Go putting pressure on these companies, holding them accountable. Uh, but yeah, you as a consumer, this is uh this is something that, that we're all, all going to be be thinking about or you know vanilla which almost all of us do um it's something to start paying attention to and putting pressure on the on the companies but you know back to vanilla as a plant it's really strange to me that one of the most popular spices on the planet has one of the most unique and strange set of adaptations that make them so hard to produce on a massive scale they they, they have such such narrow growing conditions for all those reasons i mentioned they need to grow on other things they're a vine um, they only produce flowers after several years of growth and they get big enough. They only open the flowers per day. They have a specific of internal view without the help of either an insect or a bird or a human. Uh, the, the, the flowers that aren't pollinated just die off the plant. Um, it's it's uh it's almost like this plant is doing everything in its power to tell us that I am not a good candidate for being a major culinary contributor to the world. I am a really minor player here. Uh, I am a terrible choice. Um, and you know it's a wonder that these plants even have survived today with such strict and narrow reproductive systems. But uh, they just had the fortune or misfortune of producing something that humans just go nuts for. So I will end bringing, you know, to me, vanilla brings me back to my childhood. And and one of my favorite places to hang out was at my grandparents' house. I would bake cookies with my grandma and we were done. And my grandpa would come in and I would ask him to lift me up to the spice cabinet. He was really tall. He could lift me all the way up to the top. And the reason I wanted him to lift me to the top cabinet is because that's where the vanilla was. And all I wanted to do was take that vanilla, not drink it. I mean, it probably tastes terrible. It's an extract, but I just would open up the cap and smell it. And it was just like the best thing for, for little me just to smell that vanilla. I just needed a, a whiff or two and that would be all I would need. Uh, it, it was just so good. I just like, it just made my body feel good. I was just like really addicted to it. And, and, and I'll still do that every once in a while. I'll still if, you know, if I'm in the spice cabinet looking for something else, I see the vanilla and I indulge in my time honored personal tradition of just smelling the sweetness um, and thinking to myself, wow, that's that's really nice. So there's vanilla. I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs>